second talk, which is ensemble based data simulation via nonlinear coupling. And this is by Ricardo Batista. Okay. Perfect. Thank, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Stephen, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to uh, present at this uh, very nice session. So today I want to talk about um, our work on data simulation using nonlinear couplings or nonlinear transport, and this is uh, joint work with my uh, PhD supervisor, Yusuf Marzouk. So uh, for some motivation and to set the notation for the talk, so we're interested in um, sequential inference, of course, of uh, in state space models, where we have some states that we denote by X and some observations Y. So, given some uh, dynamics for the states and some likelihood model for the observations, we're interested in characterizing the filtering distribution for the state at time T, given the observations um, up until that time point in time. And we denote that by pi of T for the state at time T, given all the observations up until uh, time T. And uh, as we know, so per performing uh, filtering in nonlinear systems is very challenging. Uh, we have the issue of very high dimensional states um, in many applications. And furthermore, we have issues of um, often very complex and nonlinear dynamics, sometimes chaotic, and very sparse observations in both space and time. And it's really these uh, two things combined in a sense that uh, lead to um, a lot of non Gaussianity in, uh, in our uh, filtering distributions. And so, in these settings, uh, the, the approach that uh, many of us follow is uh, to use an ensemble based method where we approximate the filtering distribution using some samples or particles. Um, and we evolve this uh, approximation over time and we do that by using our dynamics to um, propagate the, the samples from the filtering distribution at time T minus 1 to time T and then given an observation at time T we perform the, our analysis or effectively our Bayesian inference step of conditioning on this observation. Um, and the way that we do this using the ensemble common filter, of course, is to derive, um, uh, use these forecast ensembles to derive the linear transformation that we apply to all of our samples. Uh, and we, and uh, we push our samples through this linear function in order to get samples from the posterior or the next filtering distribution. But of course, as we increase the number of of members in our ensemble, um, this linear update is constraining and ultimately this is still inconsistent for capturing the true Bayesian um, solution. And so what uh, we've been working on is a way to generalize this idea of looking just for a linear transformation by instead looking for a nonlinear map um, that we could apply to our, our forecast samples in order to sample uh, consistently from the from the analysis or the posterior distribution at every step in the assimilation cycle. And we'd like to uh, do this, of course, given only um, some limited number of samples from the forecast. So given those samples, we need to learn this nonlinear map and then apply this map to those samples um, in order to um, sample from the posterior. And we wanna do this without computing importance weights or performing uh, any form of resampling to avoid issues of uh, particle degeneracy. So, the building block for uh, constructing these transformations is the idea of transport maps um, or couplings. And so, in a nutshell, uh, what this consists of is um, if we are given a, a generic target density that we denote by pi, something like the banana that we have here on the bottom left, and we have a simple reference density like a standard Gaussian, uh, the idea of transport maps is to construct a transformation, uh, let's say S which maps samples from the target, this banana, to samples from the reference. Equivalently, um, this map allows us to uh, take samples from the reference and sample from our target density by inverting this map and applying it to those samples. If we have such a map S, then we say that this map uh, pushes forward this target density to our reference, or equivalently, the, it uh, pulls back the reference to the target. And we denote this pullback using this upper um, sharp superscript sharp notation here. Um, now, there's many ways in general to look for these transformations, but uh, as you may have heard um, we discussed before, uh, in our work, we focus on triangular transformations. Um, these are maps, so for densities from uh, RD to uh, on RD, these are maps from RD to RD where the first component of this map only depends on one variable, the second component depends on 
two variables, et cetera. Um, and the reason why we look at triangular maps is that these uh, maps are e relatively easy to invert, allowing us to uh, use them to sample from the target density. The second is we can uh, find these maps typically by solving a problem where we minimize some distance, like the KL divergence between our target density and the pullback density, so our representation for the pull for for the target. Um, and in this case, this uh, this optimization problem actually results in um, can be solved for every component of the map uh, via these uh, nice convex optimization problems uh, that actually can be solved um, approximately given only samples from the target density. So if we only have samples, then we can solve these problems in order to learn such a map. Um, and maybe the last and most important property is that each component of this map is very uninterpretable in that it's it can be associated with one of the marginal conditionals in the factorization of the joint density. So for a joint density pi of x, we can always factorize it as pi of x1 times pi of x2 given x1, et cetera. And this first component of the map is what really characterizes this marginal on x1. The second component characterizes this conditional of x2 given x1 all the way to the end. And it's really this last property that allows us to extract um, conditionals or posteriors uh, that, um, that we're interested in uh, in filtering. So suppose that we have a joint density of parameters and data of pi of x um, and y, x being the, the parameters or the state and y being the data. And we have a reference density on the same space, then we could look for a triangular map that couples these densities. And a valid triangular map is one where the first part of the map only depends on the data, and the second part depends on both the uh, state and the data. And uh, in this case, by the last property that we mentioned on the previous slide, this first part of the map uh, characterizes the marginal on the data, while the second part, uh, the second block S of X, characterizes the conditional of the, per of the state given the data. So what that means is that um, if we have some realization of the data, then we could fix this first part of the map to uh, that particular realization. Let's call it Y star. And this map allows us to take samples from the conditional of X given Y star. So this, uh, uh, we think of this as the, a posterior of interest. And if we evaluate this map at those samples, it gives us samples from the reference. Equivalently, we can sample from that conditional of interest by sampling from the reference and inverting the set to sample from um, uh, from the, that conditional, that uh, uh, posterior of interest. Uh, furthermore, uh, we can actually um, do this for any conditional of, uh, of X given Y. And so uh, if we just have samples from the joint and we evaluate this map at those samples, then this map pushes those samples towards the reference distribution. So um, if we have these two properties, what we can do is we can uh, actually compose these two, uh, um, use these two uh, transformations in order to derive a transformation uh, that we call T that uh, takes samples from the joint density of parameters and data and allows us to map those samples to, uh, through this map to samples uh, from a conditional that we're interested in. And so this is what we call our prior to posterior map um, T that, uh, that would take samples from the joint and return samples from the posterior. And uh, using this, uh, what we call the stochastic map algorithm, we can um, apply this map to sample from the posterior by uh, using some joint samples to learn this map S um, and then apply, uh, uh, define this map T and apply this map to those samples to sample from the posterior. So in the context of filtering, we would do this at every, we could use this at every assimilation step uh, where um, after uh, applying the, the, the dynamics to generate samples from the forecast, we can use our likelihood model to sample from the uh, sample candidate data that gives us samples from the joint of states and data. Uh, we can then use these joint samples to estimate this, this map. Given a true realization of the data that we observe, we can then form this map T and apply this map to those samples to get our analysis samples. Um, now, uh, what this really does is transform the problem of um, uh, posterior sampling to one of just approximating these maps. And so we can look at how, how, this, how this performs in certain settings. In particular, 
uh, we could look at what happens when we uh, restrict the forms for these maps. So when these maps are only linear, then this uh, prior to posterior map actually uh, uh, results in the linear transformation, which is equivalent to the ENKF map. Um, but if we actually uh, introduce some nonlinearities in this map S and then in this map T, then this hopefully allows us to uh, bridge more towards something that's consistent by trying to um, uh, build a transformation that will sample exactly from um, the target density. So uh, in this work, what we propose to do is to gradually depart from this linear um, assumption that's made in, in looking for uh, in, in the ENKF by parameterizing these maps S using linear functions and some uh, uh, radial basis functions. Um, now, the final block uh, uh, before we present some results is that this uh, map also allows us to, uh, to um, uh, we can also localize this map in the same way that we localize, uh, perform localization in the ENKF uh, by using the property that these maps actually inherit a lot of sparse structure when the target density or the posterior um, uh, satisfies some conditional independence. And this is a property that uh, we often see in a lot of uh, problems that have spatial structure. And in that case, we expect that these maps to uh, be very sparse um, in that they don't depend on all their input variables. And so we could um, use this uh, structure to regularize the maps when we estimate them by, for instance, uh, looking for maps where the, each component only depends on a variable plus some variables within a certain neighborhood. And we could uh, tune this uh, neighborhood distance um, to minimize some metric like RMSE. Uh, so we apply this to uh, this method to the Lorenz uh, 96 model uh, with the relatively large inter-observation time in order to have um, a lot of non-Gaussianity in the um, in the in the distributions, um, and we looked at the um, RMSC of the filter uh, as well as spread and CRPS um, with an increasing ensemble size, um, and what we observe is that uh, as um, for very small ensembles, the uh, uh, ENKF, of course, is a very robust uh, transformation that doesn't have a lot of variance. But as you increase the ensemble size, the uh, RMSC tends to plateau because of this intrinsic bias that the ENKF has. Um, on the other hand, if we estimate maps uh, that gradually uh, increase in, in, in nonlinearity, given by this yellow and this purple line, then these maps have lower bias, um, as seen in uh, with the RMSC um, and the CRPS with higher ensemble sizes. Um, and but of course they have a bit more variance in the low ensemble size. So given a sufficient number of of uh, samples to learn these nonlinear transformation, this allows us to um, bridge between um, so, uh, something that's um, biased to something that's uh, more consistent for sampling. Uh, now, in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about a recent application that uh, we've been working on um, yeah, related to uh, estimating the flow, um, the turbulent flow behind uh, an airfoil. And so in this case, the data simulation problem is uh, we want to reconstruct the flow given only some pressure measurements along an airfoil. Um, and here at the, the challenging um, uh, problem, uh, the challenge is that as compared to the previous example, uh, is is that the observations here, the, the, the pressure, which uh, we assume to come from some high fidelity CFD model, uh, are really related to the state uh, in a non-local way. In particular, each pressure observation depends on really all of the state variables as compared to the Lorenz 96 where the observations are local. And so in this case, we can't really use this idea of distance-based uh, localization. Um, and we, but we still have very high dimensional state variables uh, and observations and a very limited ensemble size. And so in this case, we could look for a different type of structure. What we did is we uh, looked for a low rank, um, a form of low rank structure where, um, uh, and, th and this is really inspired by the idea that uh, here, each observation really affects groups of variables. Um, and so we expect that uh, the, inference or the assimilation actually takes place in a relatively low dimensional subspace um, where the observations affect uh, certain projections of the state. Uh, and so if that's the case, then we can um, uh, encode this structure 
by uh, because we can effectively perform this prior to posterior map um, in as a function of uh, lower dimensional variables. And so to define these uh, projections, um, and I'm wrapping up soon, uh, we um, uh, we can consider a case with this nonlinear observation model. Um, and we could look for these projections of the state and the observations um, by solving some generalized eigenvalue problems that depend on these gradients of the model. Um, so, uh, and, and we call this the low rank stochastic map filter. And just to see how this performs um, for this uh, aerodynamics problem where we have this high fidelity CFD that we're trying to reconstruct. Um, in uh, here, we looked at the posterior predictives given, for instance, just the forecast sample at one time step. Um, we then look uh, here, we have the posterior predictives given by the ENKF, and you could see that it really has trouble reconstructing the state uh, near the leading edge of the airfoil. And in person here, we have the low rank stochastic map filter that does uh, much better reconstructing the state and is also has lower spread. And we could look at this also um, over time and look at some statistics. So what we observe is that using these low rank uh, structure, um, we can actually perform the inference in this case in a subspace of relatively low dimension, in this case about five, um, and it results in lower uh, statistics like RMSC and spread um, over time. So just to conclude, uh, so in this work, we, look, we looked at uh, constructing uh, couplings to build consistent prior to posterior transformations. Um, we uh, showed how it can be used to improve tracking and some posterior um, statistics. Uh, and we looked at how to regularize them using both sparse and low ranks maps. And in the future, we're looking at um, how to adapt the parameterizations that we use uh, to the ensemble size uh, automatically. And uh, we're doing some studies to generalize this for smoothing. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ricardo. Uh, we have four questions. I'll try and get through them. But uh, so Peter Yan asked, the perturbed observations do not provide a good sample from the joint density as they are centered on the actual observations and not H of X true. Is that an issue? Perturbed observations? Um... Oh, okay. So uh, that's a good um... Uh, question that I want to clarify. So here we're not using perturbed observations. We're really sampling from the likelihood model. So these are really samples from the joint density of um, of X and Y, um, and not from the prior density of X times the perturbed density of the observations. So we assume that we can sample from the likelihood model. Okay, he says, okay, thanks. Okay, Javier has the question, how difficult is it to construct the actual maps? I guess they are not unique are they? If not, how does one choose an optimal transformation? Uh, good question. So um, the maps actually are uh, uh, are unique. If you can really construct, um, give, if you really have the full knowledge of the target density, um, then there exists a unique map um, between a Gaussian and that and that density. Uh, what we, of course, we only have very limited ensemble size, so we look consider a particular parameterization uh, for these maps. Um, and we have to tune that parameterization to the um, ensemble size in order to balance bias and variance. Um, so uh, here we looked at these kind of gradual way of departing from, from these uh, linear transformations towards something more uh, towards the true map. Cool. Okay, the next question is, is from Zhuguan. Does this approach only apply when we know in priori what the posterior distribution is? Uh, good question. And uh, no. Uh, so uh, that, that, that would be, um, so in this case, it's really um, all we have are samples from the joint. And, um, and we are using these maps, which allow us to extract conditionals easily. And in particular, the conditional being the posterior that we're interested in. Okay, one more question very quickly. What motivated the use of radial basis functions to enrich the complexity of the nonlinear maps? Do they do they make the convex optimization easier to solve? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, uh, in terms of the convex optimization, it's, um, uh, it's as easy to solve with other basis functions as well. Um, we just, uh, we were inspired, the radial basis functions were inspired by Trying to, um, by problems where 
there's really kind of perturbations. Um, uh, uh, these maps are really um, in non Gaussian settings perturbations of, of linear maps. Um, and so the RBFs were kind of natural there, but we've also considered other parameterizations and I'm happy to discuss that uh, offline. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for a very good talk as well, um, Ricardo. So, thank you very much.